Okay, fine. So you can use the Lagrange equations to solve constrained optimization. But come on, what is it? I mean, what does it really mean? Is it, is it something physical? Are Lagrange multipliers real? Or are they just a trick? I mean, is it just, hey, do the algebra, here's the equation, memorize it, go. No. The Lagrange multiplier does have real meaning, but it means different things to different people. Maybe you're an economist. You might think of a Lagrange multiplier as a shadow price. It shows up in that context. Maybe you're a physicist. You might think of a Lagrange multiplier in terms of a force of constraint where it shows up. But as a mathematician, I think the best interpretation of the Lagrange multiplier is it's the rate of change of the optimal value with respect to the constraint value. So that's it. Now you're done. All set. Well, what does that really mean? No, well, let me tell you. But it might take uh, viewing this uh, maybe two or three times before it really sinks in. Here we go. It's bonus time. Here's the claim. Lambda is the rate of change of the optimal value with respect to the constraint value. What does that mean? How do we make sense of that? Well, consider the constraint value as involving a new variable, c. Think of it as a cost. And we're going to look at a constraint where g of x equals c. Okay, now what we're going to do is rewrite the Lagrange equations to optimize f of x when constrained to the level set g minus c equals zero. That is where g of x equals c. And then we're going to vary c. That is, we're going to add c as a new variable. So the Lagrange equations, df equals lambda times dg, and the constraint g minus c equals zero. There we go. But notice, we now have n plus one equations on n plus two variables. The variables being the x variables, n of them, the lambda variable, plus one, and the c variable, that's n plus two. Now here's the biggie. Thanks to the implicit function theorem, we can solve for the optima of f as a function of c locally. Go back, review your implicit function theorem. This is the kind of thing that it's good for. We can't solve for it explicitly. We solve for it implicitly. We can say that those critical points are at a location x that depends locally only on c. That is, I'm going to write x as a function of c. You change the constraint curve, you change the optima. So what we want to investigate is the rate of change of the optimal f value. So what do we do? We plug those x variables that depend on c into f, and we take the derivative of f with respect to c. It's an ordinary derivative. Using the chain rule, this is the partial of f with respect to the x variables times the derivative of the x variables with respect to the c variable. Ordinary derivative on the right, since x depends on just one variable, c. Now, the Lagrange equations tell us that the partial of f with respect to x is really lambda times the partial of g with respect to x. And now to carry the equation over, we have to carry over that dx dc and multiply together. Ah, but now I see again an instance of the chain rule. It's as if we're canceling out those dx's. Ooh, not really, but uh, you know, use the chain rule and you get that df dc is really lambda times dg dc. And now comes the magic because you're on a constrained curve where g is equal to c. So if g is equal to c and you take the derivative of g with respect to c, what do you get? One. So df dc is equal to lambda times one. And that's it, we're done, that's it. That's what we were trying to show, that the rate of change of f of x of c, the function values at the optima, as a function of the constraint value c is equal to lambda. This is what the Lagrange multiplier is. And what this means visually is that if you look at the critical point on the left, that local maximum, and you look at the local maximum on the right, then the one on the left has a larger Lagrange multiplier. Lambda is bigger on the left than on the right because when you change the constraint value a little bit, you wiggle it back and forth, then the, the value of the local maximum is changing a lot. 
for the critical point on the left. For the critical point on the right, not as much. The local minimum in the middle, it's kind of in between the two. So take a look at what happens when this is set in motion, where you can see the two local maxima on either side, the local minimum in the middle, you have your constraint curve where G equals C and you change that C value. We're just gonna, we're just gonna wiggle that back and forth a little bit and we're gonna see what happens to those local maxima and local minima as we continue them. You can see the implicit function theorem in action here as we have these, these curves of local maxima and local minima and how quickly are the heights changing as a function of how you're changing the constraint value. The one on the left, wow, you're, you're changing a lot. That, that slope going up the mountain is pretty high compared to the one on the right. Now this is so cool. You are seeing the Lagrange multiplier in this example. That is such a cool thing that is so rare. You don't see pictures of Lagrange multipliers in textbooks. You really need um, something in motion to be able to see that. And it's so cool when you get what a Lagrange multiplier really means. Oh man, I wanna watch this video over and over. Oh, this is so cool. Oh, but we do have work to do, and we have to get back to solving some real problems. Maybe you're kind of hungry for that right now. Well, that's okay. That is what we're going to do next.